Hey guys, this is John, and welcome to part four in my series on climbing the rating ladder. And uh, today we're tackling players in the 1400 to 1600 rating range. We have a 15 18 opponent in this game, and I'm starting out with the usual e4, e5, knight f3. And my opponent applies knight c6. I'm going to mix in a uh, Roy Lopez. So as you're working your way up the rating ladder, you might find yourself changing opening preferences a little bit. Uh, previously, I played bishop c4 on move 3, but the Roy Lopez is kind of the, the gold standard for um, openings within e4, e5 at least. So it's good to get some practice in there. And our opponent replies with knight f6, attacking the pawn on e4. I'm just going to play d3. Castling kingside is the theoretical line, uh, but that allows knight takes e4 and the uh, so-called Berlin endgame, if black wants to enter that. Okay, and my opponent plays a6. Now, this blunders a pawn for exactly the reason that we've discussed in previous videos. It's because if I take on c6, provided they recapture, I can take on e5, and the problem for black is they cannot take on e4 in reply, uh, nor can they play queen d4, provided they take with the, the d-pawn, because our e-pawn has reliable protection. So he is taking with the d-pawn, but after knight takes e5, Jack Jerry 97 is going to find himself down a pawn with little to show for it. So that's a, a common error. Uh, Black just didn't adjust to me playing d3 and protecting the pawn. They played a move that they might know is standard in this line, but it just comes up a little empty here. So bishop c5, what is Black's threat? Black is threatening bishop takes f2 check, or possibly queen d4, which is, um, to reference, again, a video uh, from prior in this series, that's a trick you have to know in this line. So going and attacking f2 and e5. Uh, I'm just going to castle. So in doing this, bishop takes f2 no longer works because I can recapture with my rook, and there won't be any queen d4 check threat. He's still playing queen d4, but f2 is well protected now. I don't have to worry about that pawn. So I could just back my knight up. My knight is attacked. I could play bishop f4 in order to defend the knight, but that would leave b2 hanging, so I won't play that way. So I'm thinking knight f3. Uh, knight c4 would also be a fine move, I think. But knight f3 gains a tempo on black's queen, so I'll play that. And black is just going to have to go right back with the queen, as far as I can tell. I guess they could come over to b4 or a4, but those squares aren't really improvements. If they play queen d6, then I have pawn e5, forking the queen and the knight. Last video, I faced some very tough customers, I would say, in the... Uh, 1200 to 1400 rating range. So we'll see what the 1400 to 1600 rating range brings. Okay, bishop g4. So black is relying on a counterattack here. Now, this is a, a move that has to be calculated very precisely by black because whenever you rely on some sort of uh, in between move or counter to your opponent's threat rather than you know simply retreating an attacked piece, let's say, if your opponent is threatening it. Uh, you have to make absolutely certain it works. Now, let's say I take on d4 right now, so I grab their queen. They will take our queen. Bishop takes d1. And at that point, we both have hanging pieces. My knight on d4 is hanging, and his bishop on d1 is hanging. Uh, however, I have the move, so I might be able to move my knight away. And if you want to pause your video and try to figure out where I could move my knight away at that point to cause black the most harm, you can do that now. Okay, so the answer is after knight takes d4, bishop takes d1, I can play knight b3, which attacks his bishop on c5, and his remaining bishop will be under attack as well. So it's, in effect, just a double attack. And I don't see a good way out of that for black, so we'll proceed with this line. I could also maybe play knight takes c6, that's an in-between move, but knight b3 is clear-cut, and it should be winning me material. Black could move this bishop, like bishop e2, trying to counterattack once again. So attacking my rook there. Um, at that point, though, I can just play rook e1, and it's the same situation. Both of the bishops will be under attack with no recourse for black. As I mentioned last time, um, when you have opponents who make a mistake, especially early on, I've found, uh, they are likely to respond to that mistake and play the rest of the game in an aggressive manner. A lot of people, I think, just kind of get rattled or they say, well, you know, I'm losing this game anyways. I might as well just try to hit the home run and maybe I'll get lucky and get back in the game. 
which is a bad mentality. I mean, as Black here, I could tell he, um, or I could tell that Black was um, a little thrown off by losing the pawn, or at least it seemed that way. And uh, he compounded the mistake by playing too aggressively with his follow-up. Yeah, so now we bank the bishop on c5. He castles, so that's a good move. It defends b7, and also he's attacking our pawn on d3 a couple times. This pawn is hard for me to defend, so I'll probably just let it go. I could play e5 here, attack his knight. I could play bishop g5, which is a pretty good developing move to pin him. I think I like bishop g5, so I'll do that. Maybe introduce his pawn e5 as an idea. I would bet he takes on d3, though, with the bishop, which attacks my rook on f1. So the game could go bishop takes d3, knight takes d3, rook takes d3, bishop takes f6, g takes f6, and then I'll probably just make a developing move like knight c3 at the end of that line. That looks like a simple variation. I don't have to calculate too much there. It's just trades, and I'm up a piece, so I'm happy with the trades. Yeah, and let's play knight c3. I'm temporarily giving him the second rank by putting my knight here, but I do want to connect my rooks together ASAP. He doubles up. Okay, so if you want to pause your video and ask yourself, what is the best way for white to simplify in this position? All right, so hopefully you came to the conclusion that the answer is rook to d1. I'm ahead of minor piece, so again, I'm happy with trades. And by playing rook d1, we're looking to completely neutralize this play down the d-file. And we've got the, the rook on d1 backed up by the knight and the other rook, so this is going to work out well. So let's trade once. He showed an unwillingness to capture, but now we can bring this other rook right over. Nothing has changed. And after he takes, I'll take with my knight, of course, the only legal move, <laughs> which also happens to be a good one. And this endgame, Black's pawns might look a little intimidating on the queen side, but um, even with his king's help, he's not going to have enough here. What I need to do, though, is I need to get my king involved. I don't want to wait around and let him bring his king up when I don't have my king participating. So what I'm thinking about is playing f4, which gives the king a direct route up the board. So like f4, let's say he plays king d6, king f2, king c5, king e3. And then my king is up and assisting with my knight. Um, what I want to do is try to neutralize his queen side before I focus on my four versus two majority. I just don't want his pawns to get too dangerous. Another move I can play here, by the way, is b4, looking to shut down a5 or c5. But if b4, I think he'll play king d6 and then try to go c5 on the next move. So all in all, I feel much better just involving my king. That should be your natural inclination when you enter an endgame. Get your king involved as quickly as possible. There's a great book by uh, Grandmaster Johan Helston. He has a three-part series on uh, mastering chess strategy. And in Mastering Endgame Strategy, the endgame book in the series, the very first chapter is on king activity, and he, he always talks about king first. You want to play, you want to play your king first in the end game, and it's a good general rule. So f5, he's offering a pawn. I guess he really wants to get into the e4 square. I don't really see any other any other reason why he would do this. I could play king up. I could take the pawn too. I think I like just playing king up though. I'm going to deny him the use of the d5 square. And assuming he takes, I get to take with my king. And I'm nicely centralized. So potentially my king could be used on the queen side or the king side. And that's the beauty of centralization, is that you have that flexibility. All right, he plays king e6, probably looking to play f5. Let's just get this pawn going, g4. And that way we stop him from playing f5 and we mobilize our pawn majority our three pawn versus two pawn majority we have on the king side. I haven't touched the knight yet because I don't think it has been necessary. Uh, b4, I dislike that move for him because I think I'm going to be able to blockade on the c4 square. Now I will bring up the knight. And he's got these doubled c pawns that really hinder the uh, unlocking of his majority, let's say. So here I can play b3, stopping his a pawn too. And now knight c4 followed by knight takes a5 is on the cards. And he doesn't have a good defense to that. Some of you may be used to uh, like tuning out when you're in a clearly winning position. It's just you stop thinking and uh, you say, oh, I'm just going to win this. It's just a matter of time. 
But um, if you notice my thought process, even when I'm in a clearly winning position against someone I know I'm going to beat uh, 999 times out of 1,000, uh, I never relax. And you need to practice that mentality, especially at the lower rating levels. Uh, you should never relax in chess until the clocks have been stopped, literally. Like you constantly have to be scanning for threats and uh, putting yourself in your opponent's shoes and figuring out how, if you were in that losing position, how you would be trying to trick your opponent and get back in the game. Okay, and he resigned. Yeah, he played H5 and resigned. Uh, let's just go back and take a very quick look at this game. It was pretty straightforward once we won the material. Um, but the Roy Lopez is a good complement to playing Bishop C4 on move 3, which is the move that we played prior to this. Uh, I think you learn a lot about positional chess and uh, playing the game properly when you play the Roy Lopez. So it's a good good line. Uh, knight f6, and I just defended the pawn on e4 with d3. As I said, castling is the main move. There's quite a bit of theory there, but uh, I just wanted to play in a straightforward manner, and it paid off when he played a6, which is inaccurate here. Um, better moves would be like d6, defending the pawn on e5, and there's also bishop c5, which is a good counterattacking move because if bishop c5, let's say, and I do want to try to win the e5 pawn, I would have to do this. But now if I take on e5, I'm going to run afoul of tactics on f2 once again. So he could play bishop takes f2 check, king takes f2, queen d4 check with a fork on the king and the knight, or potentially just queen d4 right away, as we saw in a previous video. Um, as played, after we banked that pawn, really what black should do is just try to develop and castle. Uh, queen d4 was a very bad move. Uh, it's a premature attack. Um, as I said, it, players have a tendency to become wild when their primary plan fails or they feel the game slipping in the wrong direction. But uh, you don't want to be like that. You want to have the sense of self and awareness to continue playing, uh, hopefully as if not much has happened. It's not like you won't adjust your strategy, but you definitely don't want to overreact and say, oh, I've lost a pawn. You know, this game means nothing anymore. Um, let's just get this over with and do something rash. Maybe I'll win. Maybe I'll go down in flames. No, you should just try to proceed as normal and um, attempt to slowly get back in the game. So after he played queen d4, though, and then I play knight f3, he's pretty far behind in development. And like I said, this bishop g4 move, if you're going to rely on a counterattack move to save yourself in a tactical situation, you better have checked and triple checked your lines to make sure that works. And I'm pretty sure his calculation just stopped right here after he took on d1. And he saw in his mind's eye that um, it was an equal trade of queens, but if he would have gone one move further and seen this move knight b3, whereupon both bishops are under attack, he might have uh, been able to avoid this situation. So, um, yeah, make sure you don't overreact when you get into bad positions. All right, our next opponent is Garazda, 1578. I'm still going to play e4. Another e5 game, okay, knight f3. He also plays knight c6. Let's play bishop c4, actually. So we'll play this move again. We'll get a nice mix of a Roy Lopez game and a Joko Piano game. And bishop c5. I'm going to play c3. Knight a5. And he whipped that move out right away. Okay, I'm a little suspicious of that move. It does attack my bishop. It leaves the e5 pawn unguarded. Um, if knight takes e5, there are some tricks, though, that have to be seen by both sides. Um, there's also possibilities. So let's say I do play knight takes e5. Then my knight is being used to defend my bishop. Uh, queen g5 might be an interesting move there, attacking my knight and also the pawn on g2. Moreover, there's possibilities like knight takes e5, maybe queen f6, or, well, I guess queen f6 I have pawn d4. Or bishop takes f2 check, king takes f2, and then queen f6 check. I guess I have queen f3 in that case. But knight takes e5, you have to watch this trick, because sometimes queen g5, and that's, that's a move I'm especially worried about if I play this. Um, what else can I do here? I can play bishop takes f7 check right away. King takes f7, and then do you see how I can regain my piece? The answer would be pawn to b4, forking the bishop and the knight. That seems interesting, because his pawn on e5 will still be uh, loose after that operation. But notice how I'm pausing here, just time management-wise. I've been surprised with knight a5. I don't just want to instinctively retreat my bishop or something, because I might have tactical opportunities here. And I think I'm going to go for this line. 
I'm going to take on f7, and then after he recaptures, I'm going to play pawn b4. Because I know that will guarantee me uh, the piece back. Also, e5 is weak, and his king has been exposed. So I like where this is heading. So we've had two opponents now who've played pretty aggressively in the opening with black. And let's see how this opponent reacts to the bishop takes f7 check move. If they do not take the bishop, if he plays like king f8 or something, I'll be very pleased with my position. I can um, like take their knight and then maybe take e5. Okay, so let's proceed b4 as planned. We're getting the piece back because of this fork. If bishop takes f2 check, I'll take. And then provided he plays knight c6, I was thinking pawn b5. Try to boot the knight away from guarding the e5 pawn. Wow, queen f6. Not a good move. I mean, rather than retreating his attacked knight, he tries to pin my knight, but there's no follow-up to the pin on the knight. I can just bank his piece. Now, last video, we didn't get so much of it. I really got to say, the opponents in my last video played pretty well overall uh, in the four games that I played at the 1200 to 1400 level. Uh, so you didn't get a sense of it in that video, but what I was going to say is that players uh, will still be dropping pieces quite often here and they'll be making one and two move errors. Um, and as you're seeing already in these first two games, I played this situation, that's the case. I played rook f1 in order to allow myself to castle by hand. So now I'm gonna play my king back to g1 and take a look at his queen and his king. They're both juxtaposed along the f file. And already I, I'm threatening stuff like knight takes e5 check, discovered attack on the queen here. He is pinning me, so I do have to watch that. Um, on the previous move, instead of king g1, queen b3 check was another move I could have played, attacking the king and also the pawn on b7. But I'm up a piece. I think the only questionable thing was my king safety, so I just decided to get out of the way. Okay, king e7, that makes a lot of sense. He just sidesteps f-file stuff. Also, he sidesteps queen b3 check. Um, I could try to play d4, open the center, and then if pawn takes bishop g5, pinning him, that looks pretty good, although he could play queen takes g5 then, and I would take with my knight, he would take our queen. That line's probably good for me. Um, I notice queen b3 is also a pesky move that I can try. Let's play that move. Kind of neglecting my queen side development, but I think it's justified because we are ahead of peace and we've uh, done well with our last couple of moves to secure our king, and now we're creating a threat. So my plan is to play queen b3, attack his pawn, and presuming he defends the pawn, let's say with a move like rook b8, I was going to play d4 then. Okay, instead he decides to go on the counterattack, queen g6, threatening this pawn. Uh, what if I take b7, because that would defend this pawn. I think that looks pretty good. Let's take b7. There's ideas he has with bishop h3 trying to pin our g-pawn, but they seem to come up a little short. Okay, knight f6. You know... I like what he's doing. I think he's doing the right thing. He's trying to get back in the game um, by investing further material. Um, I think he senses that if he proceeds as normal, he's going to lose this game. So he's he's trying to uh, complicate my task by offering some tasty material. So like I can take on c7, but I suspect he's going to block with his knight or his bishop. But still, this is a free pawn with check, so we should probably take it. I just don't want to get too far behind with my queenside development. That's my my only concern. Also, my queen is, is a little bit of a concern. I shouldn't uh, dismiss that either. Here I'm looking at some tactical possibilities, like knight takes e5, because he is pinned with his knight. So like knight takes e5, d takes e5, bishop a3 check is a little tempting. And then if king e6, I would have queen d6 mate. However, knight takes e5, D takes e5, bishop a3 check. He has king e8. And I don't see a win there for me. Looks nice, but I don't see a win. So probably something like d4 just makes sense here. Also, I could maybe bring my queen back is the easiest of all. Yeah, that might be the safest thing to do. Let's just bring our, our queen back from the brink. We're pretty deep in black's position. We've raided a couple pawns. We're bringing our queen back in a way that also defends e4. 
So once we, we've sorted out the queen situation, then I'm going to bring my remaining pieces into the game. He plays an aggressive move, bishop h3, threatening mate on g2. I could play knight h4 in defense, which attacks his queen and simultaneously defends. I could also just play queen e2. That looks pretty good. Let's do that. So our queen is helping in the defense of g2. And then I'll probably play d3 or d4 and maybe bishop g5 check on the next move. If he can't win g2, the bishop is just kind of floating out there on h3, so I'm not concerned. He plays rook f8, yep. Let's play d4. He's bearing down on f3 a bit, but uh, we have that defended by our rook, also our queen. So if he takes bishop g5 check will be annoying. Bishop g4, he brings back the pin. Okay, how to proceed? Maybe bishop e3 and then knight bd2. Um, I can take on e5 as well if I wanted. If I take on e5, he can take with a knight in order to assist. So what about d takes e5, knight takes e5, knight takes e5 by me? That looks pretty good. Um, he can take our queen on e2. But then... I take his queen with check. He recaptures. I could continue trading or even play rookie one there. That should be pretty easily winning, I think. I'm a, I'm a little behind in development there, though. So again, that's the only thing that concerns me. Uh, nah, I'm just going to play this solid. Let's play knight bd2. Develop a piece. Defend the knight. Overprotect e4. I think it's solid. Yeah, he's doubling up. Let's play bishop a3. I think we're going to have sufficient defense here. Assuming he doubles up, I can take on e5 once again. So let's say rook a f8, d takes e5. He can't take with his pawn, it's pinned. So uh, knight takes e5. I can take with my knight, and this pawn would be pinned then. Our queen is hanging, but remember, I always have knight takes g6 check. So that's useful. So I feel a lot better now that I have my knight and my bishop in the game. And my rook's connected as a result. Yeah, he played king f8, but I'm pretty sure I can just take on e5. I can't take on d6 because his queen defends that, but taking on e5 should be good. d takes e5. If knight takes e5, I just have knight takes e5 myself with the pin. Arguably, I played a little greedy this game in going after the b7 and the c7 pawns, but um, I was far enough ahead where this didn't, didn't ever bother us. I'm going to take with my bishop, bank another pawn. I like the fact that this bishop also controls the f8 square, so he can't like swing a rook over and further attack that knight. I have to watch my time a little bit. With all of my babbling, I am low on time. <laughs> c4. So I'll just be making quick decisions, quick solid decisions. be interesting to do a video on time management. I may consider doing that as a continuation of like my chess fundamental series, for instance, um, because what you're seeing here is not how I would like to spend my time. Definitely. I'm talking through a lot of these concepts and it does burn up time. Okay. He's throwing that pawn down the board. Let's just do this. I think I can almost take here, but I'm just going to get out of the pen. I'll just play queen e3. He's weakening my g2 pawn a little bit. I could have tried to put a stop to that uh, pawn advance. Now I have this move. Attacking his queen and also defending g2 and opening up queen takes h3. It's a nice resource. Probably he should have played pawn h3. Because now it looks like he'll be losing further material. Yes, yeah, so let's go ahead and take that guy. Bank another piece. No more mate threats to be concerned about. He trades. Let's take back. If this queen moves away, queen takes d7 as possible. Also, I have queen e6 check right here. But queen takes d7 is pretty, pretty convincing. We win another piece. 
our back rank is fine. Yeah, he just resigned. Okay, so let's run through this. So I mixed in uh, a Joko piano here, and he played bishop c5, which is fine. Knight f6 is the other main option, the two knights variation, two knights defense. Uh, bishop c5, c3. So if you're going to play this line, you should play knight f6 and counterattack the center. Um, I've never seen knight a5 in this exact position, but I'm almost positive it's bad. Uh, so if knight takes e5, I was just worried about queen g5. This is something you have to be concerned about. There's actually an analogous variation. It's called the garbage gambit. <laughs> And that's if black plays knight d4 on move 3. I do not recommend you play this move. But the point is for black that if knight takes e5, black has queen g5, forking the knight, and also the pawn on g2. And if white continues in greedy fashion, like taking on f7, thinking, oh, this is great. I've won two pawns, and I'm forking the queen and the rook. There's this famous line that can occur. Queen takes g2, attacking the rook on h1. Rook f1. Queen takes e4 check. All of a sudden, white uh, is in dire straits with his king has to block with a bishop, and then knight f3 checkmate. Kind of a smothered mate. So that just kind of flicked across my mind when uh, he played that knight a5 move, seemingly offering up the e5 pawn. I just didn't want to run afoul of some similar idea, queen g5. Um, and I think bishop takes f7 is fine. I think the way this turned out was pretty good for me. So here, they took on f2, realizing that they're going to lose a minor piece. So they took on f2. Taking on b4 was another option. Uh, but bishop takes f2 check, king takes f2. Yeah, and then this move was egregious, and he played it right away. You you simply have to play knight c6 here, or, or knight c4 at the very least. Um, although knight c4 runs into maybe queen b3. Eh, could be some complications of d5. But you have to move the knight. I mean, there's no other real good move. Um, I think on either knight c4 or knight c6, I will win the e5 pawn. Yeah, if knight c4, d3 might be the simplest, driving away the knight from defending e5. And if knight c6, there's b5, again, driving away the knight from e5. But queen f6 just gives a piece for no good reason. So, yeah, players even this high are not immune to blundering pieces. So these first two games I've won because uh, I banked early material and they never got back in the game. I do like his strategy, though. I think he did a good job of sufficiently compl uh, complicating the game to at least um, have uh, some fighting chances. So in a non-blitz game, I mean, Black would almost certainly lose this every time, even against players around their own rating. They'd be a heavy, heavy underdog from here. But um, in a blitz game, you know, what he did is not bad. He gave me two more pawns. Black's already down like a piece, so he doesn't care about pitching a couple more pawns for an initiative. But in the process, he sped up his development. And he got coordinated a lot faster than I did. I was able to parry the threats, but I had to be somewhat careful. And as you see, my queenside pieces took a while to get in the game. Um, I don't know. I think grabbing the pawns is fine. If I was really concerned, though, I would just develop. I would play like d3 or d4 and try to get these guys in the game. Bishop g5 maybe soon. Okay, let's look for another game. Game number three coming up. Ooh, same opponent. Garazda. Okay. Plays e4. And I'm going to play a Sicilian this time. So a little more opening experimentation as we climb the ladder. I'll play d6. You know what I'm going to play? I'm going to play a classical Sicilian if he had played d4. But instead he plays c3. Against this move, knight f6 is a good reply. Attacking e4. The thing is, e4 is not actually hanging. Even if he hadn't defended it, say he had played bishop e2. Because if knight takes e4, there was queen a4 check. Nice little trick. He plays d3. That's kind of conservative. I'll just develop my knight. Uh, now, a lot of times when white doesn't go for d4 in a Sicilian... It makes sense for black to fianchetto their dark square bishop and try to play for control over the center dark squares, especially d4, since they're not trying to occupy it. So that's what I'll do. The only problem with playing the Sicilian at lower levels as black is that uh, you're going to spend a lot of time studying like cool Sicilian main lines that you've seen in books and stuff, but you might not get those situations in your games because <laughs> people will play all sorts of wacky stuff and try to avoid it. Okay, so he's proceeding with a plan that you will come across in the Sicilian quite a bit, which is to sink the bishop into h6, especially against dragon formations, and try to trade, and he's probably looking to attack me on the king side. So if you're getting attacked on one wing, the classic response is to try to counterattack in the center. So it may make sense for me to play something like d5 or maybe even c4, try to knock out this d-pawn so I can get at e4. Um, 
I also kind of like the look of queen b6 right here, which would threaten to take his bishop and then go take on b2. There's a lot of good options. I think I'm going to play e5, though. And I can try to follow up with bishop e6 and then maybe d5 in the future. Normally, when you have a, a fianchetto bishop, you wouldn't want to play e5. But given that he showed that he was you know, just going to trade the bishop off, I think it's fine to do this. Yeah, and now I'm pretty well coordinated. I only have my light square bishop to bring out and you know maybe put my queen on the seventh rank. I feel like I'm already in a good place to play d5 and try to attack him in the center. I like the fact that he can't bring his knight to a square to simultaneously defend e4, so that's what I'm trying to take advantage of. He takes. I could take with a queen or the knight. Uh, queen takes is interesting. Knight takes might allow my knight to come into f4, but you know what? I'm going to play queen takes. I'm going to see if I can pressure this d-pawn very quickly. Like one possible plan here is bishop f5 followed by rook a d8 and just attack that pawn. We need to get this piece out anyway, so let's bring it into the game where it's bearing down immediately on a weakness. He could play c4 and try to kick my queen away from the center and then maybe bring the knight up to c3, but that creates weaknesses, like the d4 square would be indefensible by a white pawn if he pushes c4. That's a prime opportunity for me to bring my knight in for an outpost. Plays knight h4, attacking my bishop. I'm not thrilled about a trade, so I'm just going to bring this bishop back. He could play bishop f3, but I'll just retreat my queen to d6 or d7. Queen g5 is possible. Looks a little scary, like bringing queen and knight close to my king, but I could play h6 and uh, force his queen back. I think at some point soon, white will have to address that knight on b1 because it's not in the game. He plays c4. Okay, so that kind of indicates he's going to He's going to try to develop the knight through c3. But like I said, that weakens the d4 square quite a bit. Let's drop our queen back to d7. I like d7 a bit more than d6 because after knight c3, he might be in range of our queen on d6. Okay, they played a knight back. Let's just bring this rook and attack along the d file. If queen e3, he'd be hitting this pawn and this pawn but I could always play queen d6 or something in reply. King h2 is pretty strange. I don't understand that move. Ah, I think I understand that move. I think he's worried that I'm going to sacrifice on h3. I've actually found that um, sacrifices on like the h3 or the h6 pawn, if they're available, are often overestimated by lower-rated players. Like, I wasn't really thinking about doing that yet. I mean, it would cross my mind having the queen-bishop battery there, but... If his king were on g1 and I sacked, I would get two pawns. His king would be open. But um, without like a, a clear follow-up, I doubt I would go for that line. Um, now here, I can focus on my main objectives in the center. And I see some sneaky ways to do that, like pawn e4. If I push pawn e4, that attacks his knight and his pawn on d3. And if he takes it, pawn takes e4 in reply. Maybe pause your video and see what I would have there. So if e4, d takes e4, what would black play? Okay, the answer would be queen c7 check. So hitting his king and exposing his queen along the d-file to attack by our rook. So I'm going to play this and see how he responds. Uh, he should not take. If he takes, he's going to lose material. So he should play probably knight e1. But that's a pretty pathetic move to have to play. Okay, he takes. Yeah, he didn't see our threat. He might have seen that if queen takes d2, he has knight takes d2 in reply, and he's fine because the knights would protect each other. But uh, I think he overlooked this move, check. Discovered attack. So he played that move a little too fast. I think he should have taken a better look around and uh, properly tried to assess what I was up to with e4. Good things happen when you centralize your pieces and you make a prior you make it a priority to uh, play through the center. You know, at the level that most of the viewers of this video are watching, it's it's just best to play in the center most of the time. Uh, don't get too wrapped up with flank play. You know, leave that to higher rated players and maybe yourself when you get a little higher rated. Um, okay, so I've won their queen. Let's bring this rook into the game. So the official material balance is he has a rook and a pawn against my queen. We'll be proceeding into our 
uh, plan, our standard plan when you're ahead in material, which is to trade down. Knight d4 is a move I could make that would induce a trade. Okay, so by playing the knight away, he uh, loses control over the e4 pawn, defense of that pawn, and I can take it and simultaneously defend c5, which is nice. So, mistake by Garazda. His play in the opening just strikes me as a little disjointed. I mean, he did the whole uh, bishop from e3 to h6, trade our dark square bishop plan, but um, it wasn't followed up with anything. And here you go, he drops another piece. I can play knight takes g5 here. So that's a, just a pure blunder of a piece. F4 attacks the knight. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that plan of bringing the bishop into h6 is only viable if it's followed up correctly. Okay, and you can see here he's playing very fast. He's blundered something else. Uh, if you want to pause your video and try to figure out what that is, black to move, what should I play? Okay, the answer is knight g3 check, forking the king and the rook. So he's been down so much material, it's, um, it's a moot point as far as who's going to win this game. But still, he, he kind of showed with his last series of moves like knight b3, knight g5, uh, blundering knight g3 check, that he wasn't looking at my threats. So even when you're, you're losing and you're down, you can still practice good chess habits. That's going to pay off. Don't just write off the game because you're losing. If you really want to get better, you have to treat every chess position you play and analyze uh, the same. You have to maintain your mental equilibrium. And just because you're down in material, it doesn't mean you can stop assessing the position objectively. Okay, as soon as you involve emotions in your, in your decisions, you're going to make mistakes. So, um, yeah, but this one mainly uh, boils down to the fact that he overlooked the very big threat after e4, pawn takes, queen c7 check, discovered attack, winning the queen. Um, so you can mix in some Sicilians if you want. Um, I think it's, it's a good opening to start experimenting when you're, let's say, 1400 plus. Uh, below that, I would pretty much stick to e4, e5 just for simplicity's sake and get some experience with that. But um, the Sicilian's a fun opening to play and it's, it's extremely reliable. Uh, and it's a it's a lifelong chess opening too. You can play it all the way up to grandmaster level. And I hope some of you guys making uh, watching this video will make it to grandmaster level. That would be awesome. Come back in ten years and leave me a comment if you do. Um, but yeah, this this bishop into h six. I can see the plan. I mean, it's good to eliminate the dark square bishop around my king. But um, so what? He takes it, and yes, I've traded off that bishop, but. That was a time-consuming maneuver. It took him two moves in order to do that, and he doesn't have a lot of follow-up threats. We attacked in the center. I mentioned that d5, I think, was a, a prime opportunity, and um, he had trouble developing this knight. He castled and then played knight h4 and, yeah, c4. I think right around here he probably should have just brought his knight out. Um, he maybe overreacted to the bishop takes h3 possibility too. In general, like just giving up a piece for two pawns to weaken the opponent's king is not quite enough compensation. If I could give up the bishop uh, for two pawns and have follow-up threats that I thought were dangerous, I would do it. But giving up the bishop for simply two pawns would not be enough. And e4 take and one material. Okay, I'm searching for another game. Um, Let's see what we get this time. Ah, oh, it's the same player. Uh, I kind of want to play someone else, so I, I think I'm going to try and look for a different opponent. Just want to get a good mix of opponents in, since we played this player twice already. Oh, he's very persistent. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, nothing against you, Grazda. I just want to get a, a good mix of players going. Okay, I'm going to play a three-minute game, actually, against this player. Oh, this guy's outside of our rating range, though. Or that one, too. <laughs> Let's see. How about... Hmm. Oh, I'm getting the warning message from chess.com about uh, aborting too many games. Um. All right. Since, uh, since this guy... Well... All right, I'm going to play one more game against this guy. 
All right, let's play knight f3 this game. And let's go back to the Roy Lopez. So we've kind of switched off now. We had Joko Piano, Roy Lopez, and now we're going back to Roy Lopez. Plays d6. Yeah, reliable defense of, e of e5. It's just castle. a6. I think I will take the knight on c6 now because uh, he's made a few pawn moves already and I'd like to open the center after this by playing d4. I think this would be all right to do. He takes, I take with the knight. So now I'm attacking the c pawn. Bishop b7. Yeah, the pawn is defended, but uh, I don't know about that diagonal for the bishop. Provided he can play c5, it might be okay, which he maybe will be looking to do next move. I'll just play knight c3. That means my e4 pawn will be defended in the future. He does play c5, okay. So I want to move this knight, and looking at a couple places that I can move it to, uh, knight f5 looks like a good one. Um, then I would eye the g7 pawn. He could play g6 then, though, and kick it away. I could go back to g3, but mm, I don't know. Maybe just knight f3 is fine. Ah, knight b3 is also interesting. Maybe knight b3 is worth considering, because then I could perhaps try to get the knight into a5 and harass that bishop. Let's try that. The knight's kind of sidelined over here, uh, but I do have this idea with knight a5. He could play pawn a5 trying to stop it, although that costs him a little more time. Plays knight e7, kind of defensive. All right, let's sink the knight into a5, making yet another move with this knight. But uh, it comes with tempo, so that's all right. Rook b8, so he defends the bishop. I'll take it. Now a6 is going to be a weak point that maybe I can attack. Like queen d3 would make sense here. Hitting that pawn, let's do that. Queen e2, same thing. Get a piece out and attack something. Looks pretty good. He could play rook b6 or rook a7 in defense. Probably queen a8 would be dubious because I don't think he wants to assign the queen to simply defend a pawn that early. Probably rook a7 is prudent. On b6, the rook's a bit exposed. I might have knight a4. Yeah, and he does play that. Here I can bring my bishop out, because his rook is no longer attacking the b2 pawn. So debating all these squares to bring the bishop to, I like bishop g5 the most, because it, it's a pin on his knight. And if I can get him to play like f6, that might be a slightly weakening move. Like now the diagonal and the light squares around his king have been compromised somewhat. So let's bring the bishop back here. We'll go to e3, and maybe I can make something of those weakened squares. For instance, at the moment he decides he wants to castle, like maybe I can play queen c4 and thereby stop him from castling. Still, though, he needs to complete his development, so he should probably play knight g6 or maybe knight c6 so he can get his bishop into the game. Yeah, knight c6 makes sense. All right, so what to do here? Rook a d1, maybe get our queen, our rook lined up with his queen. Looks fine to me. Useful move. Yeah, so now he's about to castle. Ooh, however, there's kind of a little trap here. So let's say he does castle, just picturing that position in our mind's eye. Do you see what attack I would have in that case to win material? Okay, so I could play queen d5 check in that case, which would win his knight. So I could play a sneaky move like f4, which would uh, control the e5 square. Yeah, it might be worth it. I wonder if f4, he has knight b4, though. That's the only thing I'm wondering. f4, he has knight b4, and... If I play queen c4, my pawn on c2 hangs. Hmm. 
So as much as I want to play f4 and see if he falls into that trap, I'm a little bit worried about that line. Maybe I should play a3 then, like a prophylactic move. Okay, let's do that. And also it might help in playing b4. Yeah, and he just castled instantly, so he didn't see the idea, but queen d5 check, picking up the knight. So when you've weakened your king like that, you have to be extra cautious. And his sense of danger uh, was, was not there. He didn't connect the pawn being on f6 versus f7 to the fact that his a2g8 diagonal has been compromised. So now he's down a piece. f5, okay, so I think, as we've seen, he's probably going to start playing aggressively. I'll take it. This rook looks good on the e-file, so let's bring it there. We've got f2 defended by the king and the bishop, so I'm not concerned. Bishop h4. I see some sneakiness I could maybe do involving the rook coming to e8 eventually. I could try to move this bishop away, or even play bishop takes c5. That would be kind of nifty. Bishop takes c5. Yeah, that would hit the rook here too, and we're defending f2. So let's do that. He could play rook a8 in defense, save his rook and just retreat and cover the back rank. But then we've picked up a pawn. I can bring my bishop back to e3, or even uh, maybe a counter-attacking move like queen e4, because if rook... Actually, no, sorry, queen e4 would not work because his bishop is defended by his queen. So let's just bring this back. Picked up uh, another pawn. I think g3 soon would be good too. Just kick his bishop away. Ooh, so queen f6, what did he blunder with that move? The rook in the corner. He didn't see that this was possible now. So he lost sight of that piece. Yeah, so this player has um, a serious issue with undefended pieces, hanging pieces. I think uh, they've shown that with these last few games. It's uh, And in every one of these games, they've just handed me material, and I didn't have to do much to achieve that. So let's go back and take a look. Uh, so another Roy Lopez, bishop b5. They played d6 this time. And as a refresher from the black side, I like a6. That's a move I would recommend that you guys play. But d6, castles, and now a6. And I decided to take and play d4, trying to use my slight lead in development. I have a knight out, and my king is already castled, so it's uh, less risky for me to open the center than it is for black to deal with an open center because his king is still sitting here. Yeah, and we developed pretty normally in this game, I would say. Um, there was some debate in my head where to put the knight, like b3 or f5 or f3. I think maybe knight b3 could be met by pawn a5. If he played that move, that would stop my knight from coming in because it would be defended by the rook. Um, it would be another pawn move for him, though. As played, I kind of like the fact that I got the knight into a5. We traded the knight for the bishop, and then I sought to bring my pieces in quickly, and ideally with the gain of time, attacking stuff each time, like queen d3, attacking the pawn on a6. Anytime you can develop and simultaneously attack something, that's a good thing. Here I develop my bishop out to g5. So it's not that g5 is like a better square necessarily than like f4 or e3 for the bishop to end up on. It's the fact that g5 pins his knight and induces him to make a weakening pawn move, like h6 or f6. If he had played h6 here, I was playing bishop h4, keeping the pin, and seeing if he would push another pawn on the king side because I feel like that's going to pay dividends for me when his king castles on that wing, which is the only safe wing for him to go to. Clearly, he can't castle on the queen side anymore. So sometimes you can bring your pieces out in a way that encourages your opponent to overextend with their pawns. So that's what I was striving for with h6. Uh, let me go back to the game. So instead, after bishop g5, he played f6. And now I drop the bishop back here. Um, in comparison to the last line, bishop h4 wouldn't make as much sense now because there's no pin. Uh, he could just play, after bishop h4, knight g6, and he would be attacking that bishop on that square with tempo. So bishop e3, knight here. Rook a d1, just centralize. Bishop e7. Yeah, and um, debatable what uh, the best move is right here for me. I could play queen d5 or queen c4 right away. But um, that like makes it known to him what this little trap I'm trying to set up is. Or no, I shouldn't say that. That that makes it clear to him that um, I'm trying to stop him from castling. Whereas with uh, this move I played a3, it's a useful move. It stops knight b4 and also maybe prepares pawn b4. Uh, but 
my intentions with the move are kind of obscured. So the real intention was to encourage him to do this so I could check. This is, example, this is an example of a good trap. Uh, the traps that you set in chess should be intelligent ones. They shouldn't be traps where you're just hoping that your opponent falls into them and the move is otherwise not good that you're playing to try to set up the trap. But if you can justify the move, and especially if the move has some auxiliary purpose, like here I'm, you know, I have the idea of b4 and I'm controlling the b4 square so he can't bring his knight in to harass my queen. If you can have some other justification for it, then by all means try to set up your trap. Um, I thought about f4 too, but I just wasn't sure if he goes knight b4, um, how great that was for me. Because if queen c4, then knight takes c2. So a3 just stops that knight b4 move. He could play knight e5, but in that case I could play queen d5 all the same and stop him from castling. So, but yeah, as played after this, he castled and I got queen d5 check in and it was very much downhill for him after that. Okay, I'm going to look for another game. I see my same opponent is still searching for a game. I'm kind of afraid if I do another seek that he's just going to immediately click on that. Again, nothing against Garazda, but uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look for just to seek manually. It'd be interesting to play a computer too. Computer would be a... It'd be interesting to do a series where I play like computers at the various rating levels and see how they cope. Um, you know, because I found that computers blunder lots of pieces at the various levels too. Okay, here I'm playing Ronin Samurai. This is actually a one minute game, but it's with a, a nice increment, a seven second increment. Oh, he aborted. Ah, too bad. Okay, let's try for another one. How about this game? Extra Terrestres. This is a three minute game with a two second increment. A 1595 opponent. So we got an opponent at the high end of the rating spectrum here. Okay, he opens with e4. Let's go back to e5 for this game. Knight f3, knight c6. Bishop c4. So I like to move bishop c5 in reply to this for the reason I mentioned before, because it rules out knight g5. All right, let's play knight f6, d3. So this opens up maybe the possibility of pinning me with bishop g5. And I could try to respond to that by playing h6, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play d6, and if he plays bishop g5, I will play h6 then. All right, so now he plays c3. So he's developing um, in a way that would be characteristic of the Joko Pianismo, where you play c3 and d3. So that's the name of the, the opening. Um, I could castle right now. I could play h6 again, like I was saying. Uh, but he might play d4 pretty quickly in the center. I think I'm just going to castle, though. Let's see if he plays bishop g5 at a time where it might be annoying for me to break the pin. And I'm going to see if I can give you guys some strategies in doing that. Instead, he plays b4. Okay, we'll drop the bishop back. He might continue with a4 trying to trap the bishop. I'll play a6 in that case. a5 was another possibility, but uh, I like a6. So he's gained a bunch of space on the queen side, but black is solid. The structure is fine for black. Knight bd2. Looks fine. Okay, I'm going to play bishop e6. And this is something that's acceptable to do, like offer a trade of bishops in a Joko piano or Joko pianismo position, where if the trade occurs, you get an open file. So if he takes on e6, I can take with my f-pawn and I'll have a nice open file to work with. Okay, queen b3. So now he's threatening to take on e6 and win a pawn, so I have to be aware of that. Um, I could play queen d7 would be a good move. Queen d7 or queen e7. Those are my top choices right now because both moves help defend this pawn. I think I'll go to e7. So just reinforce this and connect the rooks together. He could play knight g5 as a way to add yet another attacker here, but... Um, I could even play rook a8 if I wanted to be stubborn. Usually when they develop the knight through d2 like this, they intend to go to f1. So like they'll move the rook to e1 and then play knight f1. So we'll see if my opponent does that. Because otherwise it's a little hard to include the bishop. And also the knight uh, wants to get over to the king side. So they want to play like knight f1 to g3. 
try to swing over to the king side. He plays a5. We just have to react to that, moving our bishop. Now b5. Okay, so our opponent is playing very forcefully on this side of the board. I can't take on a5 with my knight because his rook is backing it up. I should probably take with the pawn. Queen takes, and then he'd be threatening this pawn on b7. But I can defend it with rook b8. He might persist with a6, which would be interesting. Hmm. I'm going to try to set up a trap here, actually. So I'm going to play queen d7 which is an indirect way of defending this pawn. And I, you'll see what I mean. If you want to try to pause your video and figure out why queen d7 indirectly defends b7, you can do that now. Okay, so the idea is that if he takes the pawn on b7, and I'm going to take with this pawn, but if he takes the pawn on b7, I can play rook f b8, and he'd have to play queen a6, and then I have this discovered attack, bishop takes f2 check, winning his queen on a6. So that's a trap, but again, we were talking about it in the previous game. You want to set intelligent traps, and I think that's a reasonably intelligent trap. I didn't play a deliberately um, bad move in order to entice him into playing queen takes b7. So bishop b2. It seems like he sees what we're up to. Bringing the knight to h5 and then into f4 is interesting, so I may do that. This capture still does not work, so... That's fine for us. He can maybe try to play a6 in the future. Take and then take with a rook. That would be interesting. You know what? I'm gonna, For that reason, I'm just going to play this right now. I'll overprotect b8. I think he kind of sees the that queen takes b7 is bad, and I doubt he would do it with this bishop on b2 especially, so I think assigning the rook to defend this pawn is fine. h3. All right, now I'm going to try to maneuver my knight in. On f6, it wasn't doing a whole lot. And I do have this semi-open, half-open f-file to work with. So I'll play knight h5 and think about sneaking the knight into f4. Okay, that's a pretty good move, I think. Maybe I can play knight f4 all the same. If he takes here, I take with my pawn. I would have doubled pawns. But if he takes e5 with his knight, I take back. He takes with his queen. His knight on d2 will hang. Ah, but I have to be careful. So if... Knight f4, he might have d5, might be what he's trying to do. Moreover, I can't take this pawn right now because my knight on h5 would hang. Very clever move, sir, d4. Yeah. Yeah, gotta admit, I uh, maybe underestimated that. I'm gonna play queen back to e8 to defend this. If he takes on e5, I'll take with my knight. Because then our queens are opposing each other, so I don't lose a pawn in that case. Ooh, this is a 3-2 game. I don't even get the 5-second increment. <laughs> Alright, we got to start playing a little quick then. 3-2 is a little faster. Alright, so now I'm going to take this way, so the queens are attacking each other is the point of this operation. If he takes, I think I'll take on f3 with check. Just a little in between. Ooh, he, he dropped his queen. Ooh. Unfortunate blunder by extra terrestres because he uh, he was doing pretty well there. He maybe even had me on the defensive a bit. Yep, he just kind of got tunnel vision and saw he could take the knight and dropped his queen in the process. Yeah, now I can take his bishop here. Don't think my queen gets trapped. Yeah, we can take the bishop safely. We also have queen takes c3 as a threat, so if he comes and attacks our queen, I can take there. I'm going to offer this opponent a rematch after the game, because I think he played well, and uh, he's right at the top of the rating range, so I think this is a good guy to play. Let's come here, then we attack f2. He defends. I think I can play knight g3, because he is unable to take it due to the pin. He could attack our rook, yep, like that. I'm going to go here. So now if he plays rook c1, I have knight e2 check, forking the king and the rook. So poor extra terrestrials, we kind of <laughs> uh, turn on the afterburners there and 
are going to get him in the end. But um, he played a very good game up till that point. Let's go after F2. Let's come here. Let's give a check. Just weaken his position a little bit. Now I'm threatening to take his uh, rook next move. Ooh, we moved his king and we have checkmate. Okay. Um, so, yeah, going back a little bit in this game, I think his opening was was interesting, like expanding on the queen side like this, pushing all his pawns. Looks pretty good. Um, and again, that trap that I was setting up with queen d7 was if queen takes b7, I have rook f to b8, queen to a6, and then bishop takes f2 check. And that would be a discovery on his queen. But otherwise, he played okay. Not bad at all. I'm not sure I would put the bishop on b2. I'm a little negative about this entire plan. But um, unfortunately for him, he just took the eye off the ball and he missed uh, queen takes queen. I think the the likely con conclusion or uh, continuation would have been uh, queen takes e8, knight takes f3 check, knight takes f3, and then probably I would have taken with this rook in order to keep this one on the file. I like my position. I think my knight can come in here due to the pin on the f-pawn or maybe to f4 too. Okay, let's see if we can get this opponent again, if he's still around. Then I'll look for one more. Okay, let's play this player, TLW1423. This is a three minute game, no increment. Uh, let's go back to the Sicilian. All right, they play d3, not a critical move in the Sicilian on move two. But again, if you study this line, a lot of people uh, will not play the main lines. But don't get frustrated about that. Even though they're not playing the main lines, um, it's still good to learn a thing or two about what the main lines are because you will encounter them as you move up the rating ladder. Okay, I'll just play knight f6. Castle. Now in the Sicilian, a lot of times black ends up playing on the queen side. So this would be a typical position where I want to go rook b8 and then try for b5 attempting to expand this way. There's a rule, in thumb, uh, rule of thumb in chess that says your pawn structure points to the side of the board where you should usually play on. And if you see black's um, E, D, and C pawns are all pointing towards the queen side, so that's what I'm going to do. He's maybe moving his knight out of the way to get ready for F4, but I'm kind of Johnny on the spot right here, no pun intended, to attack him on the queen side, counterattack. Knight A4. Uh, let's bring this knight into D4. This bishop, in uh, some of these closed Sicilian lines where they're not pushing d4 immediately, this bishop is sometimes the last piece that you want to develop. Sometimes people will just put it on d7 or b7 as a course of habit, but it's good to like let the play develop a little bit and see where to put this. It's not critical that you put it somewhere right away. Okay, b3, he's kind of weakening the diagonal leading towards his rook. I'm going to play bishop b7. I like the potential I have here. I could try to move this knight back to d7, which would set up the threat of knight takes e2 check, opening up bishop takes rook as an option. So that is possible. All right, he plays c3. Yeah, let's just take that. And I think I would like to move this knight away. So like knight back to d7. Because um, then we unleash the power of this dark square bishop. b3 is a little bit weak. I'm tempted to... Um, Look at stuff like knight takes b3, queen takes b3, bishop takes e4, but it's unsound. I think we only get two pawns for that. So let's just bring this back. We might have opportunities down the long diagonal. Ooh, brings the rook in, but that rook is overextended. Hmm, half tempted to do something sneaky here, but I'm just going to play this. Attacking the queen and also attacking b3. I was thinking maybe I could have taken on e2 and then brought my bishop into d4, which would be on the same diagonal as his king and his rook. But that might have been a little bit too too fancy, let's say. <laughs> I think this is fine. If rook back to a3, maybe uh, rook a8 and offer a trade of rooks, I think would be fine. If I can entice this rook to trade off, then that's one less defender of his pawn on b3. Now, I don't see how he's going to hold this pawn. Yeah, so he just abandons the defense of it. Let's go and take it. We've got it backed up with our knight. His knight on h2 is kind of languishing too. Ooh, bishop e3. That was a mistake. If you want to figure out why that was a mistake, pause your video now. What should black play? 
Okay, that was a mistake because I have bishop take c3. So taking the knight and rook a1 might be a possibility now. I can try to trade rooks along the first rank and simplify. Bishop g4, should I play rook a1 right away? Absolutely not. Our knight on d7 is attacked. We need to address that problem first. So let's play knight f6 and attack his bishop. Hmm. He's offering a trade, but he gets his knight into the game if I do that trade, so I'm just going to trade rooks instead. I don't have to swap immediately with him. Let's take with our bishop. If he takes here, I'll take with my h-pawn, probably. We've got 38 seconds. I'd like to have a little more time, but it's fine. Uh, let's play c4 now. Looking to knock out that pawn, so I can take here. Simplify a little bit. Now he'll probably take on g6, if I had to bet. I'm going to take it this way, towards the center. Next, I'll probably go after c4, if allowed. Now I'll take here. And then I'm going to pull my bishop back and give a check. So I've got two nice bishops operating together like this. And I can go check here, and now win this pawn. This is nice. He doesn't have enough around my king to really bug me. Now I've got this nice four-pawn mass that I'm going to start advancing. Offers a trade. I'm happy to do that. If we can get a trade of knights, that will be the icing on the cake for us. That should guarantee victory. Let's offer another trade of pawns. I wouldn't necessarily want to trade too many pawns, but uh, this is fine what we're doing for now. Here I'm attacking that pawn on h3. He's going to be double attacking our bishop and also this. Let's bring this up. I'm going to start playing some quick moves now. <laughs> so you guys tuned in for an instructional video and you get to see my, uh, my bullet skills instead. How about that? Let's push this pawn. I think knight coming to f3 next is very good. If possible, I could have done that on the previous move actually. Let's give a check, go take this pawn. Mm -hmm. Might have to go hide our king for a moment. Let's see if he'll take on f5, he does not. Okay. And now we're up a piece plus three pawns and he lost on time. All right, so that's a good illustration of why I don't recommend playing with um, uh, without an increment if you want to focus on improvement. But nevertheless, we got a pretty interesting game right there that was largely decided by um, him dropping something at some point. So this is a good quick illustration of um, a plan that's common in the Sicilian, which is queenside expansion for black, playing rook b8 and b5. And by the way, uh, playing rook b8 in order to prepare b5 is preferable to playing a6 because um, a lot of times your rook will be uh, useful on the b file and by playing rook b8 and then b5 you could follow up with a5 and one go if you play a6 here and then b5 you may regret the fact that your pawn is on on a6 and you might want it on a5 anyways so the theory is you'd rather play the rook move than the pawn move because your pawn might be coming up to a5 and a4 anyways so um what other things are there to discuss in this one. Yeah, he played for a kingside attack, but it never really got off the ground. Like, if he was able to come up a bit more aggressively with, like, G and F pawns, and maybe got his knight involved too, maybe play, like, G4, F5, uh, get a queen bishop battery going, and try to come in with the bishop to H6, sort of like my one of my earlier opponents did, maybe that would have been uh, more threatening, but we were a bit ahead of him with our counterplay on the queen side. I had a nice knight on d4. I wasn't looking to trade for this bishop here. Knight d7, unleashing our dark square bishop. Rook a7 is a very loose move. That's an undefended piece, and we know that undefended pieces are magnets for tactics. So one thing I was considering here is uh, a line like c4, and then say, let's say pawn takes c4, knight takes check. And if queen takes, I would have bishop d4, forking his king and his rook. But um, you know, we ended up talking a little bit about traps today, I don't think that's a good trap because, for one thing, there's a refutation. He can take with his knight, 
and defend here. Although actually in that case I have queen b6. So maybe that is possible. But um, overall, just with the amount of time I had, that trap seemed complicated to pull off and several things have to go correct for that trap to work. Um, in retrospect, maybe it's the best move c4, but I wasn't sure about it at the time. Um, if I had more time, I might have tried to think about that a little bit. But uh, I just played queen b6 and ended up attacking his rook and his pawn here. He backed this up and I played rook a8 looking to swap. Probably he should have played knight a4 at this point, attacking my queen. But uh, after he takes, like now he has a difficult time defending this pawn and soon he wound up losing a piece thereafter. Okay, so we got several ga good games in today, instructive games. Um, as you can see, blunders are still prevalent. And uh, based on our games in, at the, the last level, you might have been wondering like if players who reach like, you know, 1200 or something uh, just magically stop blundering. But as you can see, even higher rated players still do make mistakes and quite a lot of them too. And you want to be ready to take advantage. Um, I think we talked about the importance of patience in this video, uh, not overreacting when things do not go our way, uh, approaching positions objectively, trying to be objective in all of our decisions, even when we're in losing positions, having um, the wherewithal to try to look for the best move at all times. And uh, hopefully I gave you a few opening tips and, and new lines that we played like Roy Lopez and also the Sicilian. So thank you guys for watching and uh, I'll be back soon with another climbing the rating ladder video. All right. Bye guys.